HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Jewel by Chef Steps is a proud sponsor of Beer Sessions Radio. Jewel sous vide is the future of the kitchen. Jewel, perfect food every time. Learn more at chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E. I'm one of HRN's interns, Nina Medvinskaya, with a preview of the next episode of Meat and Three, our weekly food news roundup. This week's topic, the marriage of food and danger. Sometimes, danger lurks in the food that we eat. So instead of saying what is poisonous, I'd rather say what's not, because it's literally just the flesh and the fins. Food poisoning doesn't just threaten our bodies, but it endangers our environment as well. The emissions of JBS, combined with the other top five meat companies, exceed the annual emissions of Exxon, Shell, or BP. For more, tune into this week's Meat and 3 on Heritage Radio Network. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey guys, today is Tuesday, December 11th, 2018. I'm Jimmy Carboni, the host. We're here in the studios in the back of Roberta's Pizza in Bushwick. Wow, what a great show. I mean, it's, it's holiday season, and we've got some of the most interesting food and beverage people in New York State here today. So let's just start. They're going to go around the room and introduce themselves, and we're going to talk some really interesting New York sourcing and some other cool New York traditions of culinary America like uh, beefsteak. Here we go. My, my hero, this is a chef that has inspired me and I've been thinking about for a long time, Mr. Waldy Malouf. Oh, good to be here, Jimmy. Thank you for having us. Uh, I am Waldy, Waldy Malouf, and I um, am the Senior Director of Food and Beverage for the Culinary Institute of America. I had restaurants here in the city most of my life. A few years ago, I went up to this my alma mater and decided to help them uh, build some new restaurants as the school grew. We needed more r- more classrooms, and so all our restaurants are classrooms as well. And uh, we ended up building a student um, food hall. And in within the food hall, we decided to build a seven barrel brewery. Uh, I had some. I have uh, I have a long history with Steve Hindi and Garrett Oliver at Brooklyn. Where I had the Hudson River Club Brooklyn years ago, Brewery, yeah. and uh, we we sort of started out together, and, and that's kind of what, what the main direction we're going to talk about today. Okay. And you brought with you um, our buddy Hutch. Hey, uh, Jimmy, how you you have a new job, don't you? I do. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Hutch Kugman. I'm the head brewer for uh, brewery at the CIA, where I work with Waldy, and um, we teach students about the culinary students about brewing. Great. And quick, everyone else, we've got a couple on New York brewers and farmers and media people here as well. So Jamie. I'll start out. I'm Jamie Adams. I'm the owner of St. James Brewery. Uh, we're a farm brewery located on Long Island. John? My name is John Kinzella. I'm a farmer from eastern Long Island in Wading River. Um, fourth generation, currently working the farm with uh, my father. We have 20 acres, and uh, we grow hops, asparagus, strawberries, uh, blueberries, raspberries, among other things. Great. And my good buddy from Ale Street News. Uh, Tony Forder. Great to be back on the show, Jimmy. Uh, Ale Street News since 1992. Uh, it's been awesome to watch the evolution of uh, food and beer um, over the last 25 years. 
Guys, thanks for joining me. So what's special about this show is that, um, you know, Waldy, I've looked up to you as a chef for a long time. And I remember it was a few years ago I heard about Brooklyn Breweries opening a, a, a brewery at the Culinary Institute of America. And it sounded amazing. And then Hutch, Hutch from who had worked at Crossroads Brewery, another one of my favorite breweries in New York State, was going to be the head brewer. I was like, what kind of job is that? That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, I thought it sounded amazing, too. That's kind of why I decided I should probably apply for the job. So um, it's great, actually. You get to work with Brooklyn Brewery. Uh, they help fun, you know, design and fund the brewery, help design a brand new class for our students. So we teach a class called the Art and Science of Brewing. It's for our bachelor students. And uh, then I get to work with the CIA as well. And, and Brooklyn's great. They <clears throat> act in a really supporting role. But uh, otherwise, the CIA, you know, really work closely with the CIA and uh, wow. and get to work with the students. Which for me, I, I don't know if you know this, but before I got into brewing, uh, now sixteen years ago, as it turns out, I was a middle school teacher. So uh, for me, teaching is kind of a natural thing. Probably college students are easier than middle school students. <laughs> yeah, um, when I say I taught seventh grade, everyone kind of goes, "Oh, you know, sorry." <laughs> everyone says, "Sorry." You know, one one seventh grader is a wonderful kid. Uh, Thirty of them are a nightmare. So uh, yeah, college students are great. Um, so they can drink and have sex, and you know, especially our. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try not to stay. I try to stay out of that part of their life, but uh, we do taste beer responsibly in class. I like to put it that way. Yeah. Well, Wally, tell us this. So you 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 went to CIA how many years ago? I graduated in 1975. Many you know, many years you ago. You had a great career, yeah. and everyone can look yeah. you up. So I'm not going to. But Hudson River and Hudson you have River Club, Rainbow and, Room cookbooks. Yeah, and but, and. Going sort of back a, to Culinary Institute of America to, to be the f- director of the food and the beverage there, that's amazing. Well, it was a perfect time in my life where I was restaurant-free for the first time in about 30 years. And um, I have a good re- relationship with the president and the provost of the college. And they, were, they knew they were going to be building s- some new classrooms, new classroom restaurant classrooms, and they needed some help. And they uh, convinced me to help them. And we've actually built... Uh, Five new restaurants plus the uh, egg, which is where the brewery is, the food hall, and um, for the students. And since since I've been there, and uh, so it's it's been a really great. It's a great job. I get to work with students. I get to work with people like Hutch. I get to work with some great chefs, and um, it keeps it's. That's keeps great. Very, so let's talk more about busy. how you you put together this the the brewery at the Culinary Institute and some of the things that that it's doing. You know, there's there are classes or. Are students actually making beer and learning to make beer with Hutch? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very hands-on class, for sure. We, I had a relationship, like, like I said, with, with Brooklyn and um, Garrett and Steve and um, Eric. And we, when we, this happened, we realized that, okay, we were opening a semi-professional brewery and we needed some help with it. And I needed some, we needed some guidance. And uh, they were thrilled and excited to be part of it and be, make, this, make this happen. And we, they, G- Garrett and Steve helped, me, helped us put together the design of it and worked on the curriculum with us and our, and our instructors and Hutch and um, to help get us started with some recipes and some, um, really the curriculum for the class. And then Hutch came on, and they Brooklyn stays on to this day, and will for many years. We hope as a collaborator and a, and and a help us. It is a CIA brewery, but Brooklyn is our sort of mentor, sponsor, and collaborator. And it was really a natural fit. I mean, I'm sure everyone in here owns Garrett's book on food and beer pairing. It's still kind of the go-to. Um, source, table. Yeah, yeah, Brewmaster's Table. I still have my copy, uh, dog-eared. I still flip it open when I get, when Waldy asked me to do a beer dinner, and I it's some ingredient that I've never worked with before. Um, so to, to go to Brooklyn, I think, was a natural thing. It's one of their big passions is, is uh, pairing with food. Uh, and so they're great. They really do act in a supporting role, uh, are there whenever our students need them, um, but also um, – definitely uh, allow us to then do our own thing. So it's all unique beers made at our restaurants and sold at our student commons. Tony, I, I, know, I know you've been up to the brewery at CIA. Yeah, a few times, Tell us uh, about it. Take my daughter up there. I've been to the egg. Uh, one of the things I noticed through Ale Street News is that um, I've just been quite active in collaborating with other brewers in New York State as well. And uh, it's great. They all get together and, and make a particular brew, a lot of it, at the CIA. Right? Yeah, well, that's where the fun is, right? I mean, who wants to make the same thing all the time? So... Um I mean, one or two of the same things. Yeah, you got to have some standards. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, we do a lot of collaborations, uh, both on premise and off premise. Um, but yeah, it's fun. Be more creative that way, right? Take take advantage of the of all the great chefs that I get to work with, all the great ingredients we get to work with. Um, you know, kind of that's one of the great things the CIA offers is that we have this depth of knowledge that as a brewer I get to tap into. 
So in terms of the, the program, so I'm a student. I could, I could be, what, in my 20s? I could even be older, and I could go there, to Culinary Institute of America. Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, we, we, late o- over the years, we've got our, our average age has, has, has gone down. So most of our students are between 18 and 24, 25, but come from... I don't know, 14 different countries from around the world, that we, but we have returning GIs and veterans and uh, people that are 30, g- career changers. But now it's like you guys are at the top of your game. So if you want to be in, in management or other top levels of hospitality, that's yeah. really the school Yeah, to I mean, go the brewery is actually you know, part of a much larger part of the school, which is offering a more complete education to our students. Right. Um, it's not just about being a good chef or being good in the kitchen or having good skills, although that is important. And for a lot of our students, that's what they're passionate about. But a lot of uh, uh, many students come to the school. Uh, probably every student that, that enrolls there thinks they're either going to be on TV uh, or they're going to own their own restaurant. And then they find out that maybe that's not what they're really passionate about. Maybe what they're passionate about is managing people or maybe they're passionate about beverages. We have a beverage specialization where you can go uh, take, you know, you don't have to take the brewing class, but most of them do. You can go to our Napa Valley campus and learn more about wines. You can learn about spirits and mixology. Uh, we have an entrepreneurship program where the students design a restaurant concept. Uh, it's right across from where the brewery is. And they pitch these these uh, concepts to a panel of judges and chefs, and one of them wins, and they run it as a business for a semester. Everything from food costs, labor costs, um, some of them do very well and some of them fail, and I think there's lessons in that. So it's really all about providing uh, a, a very comprehensive education to our students, and, and beer is a big part of that. Um, as you guys all know, you know, the time when beer didn't belong on the table with wine in fine restaurants is long since passed. So uh, it really was necessary for us to have this brewery and to, to offer this education and to keep expanding our offerings to our students uh, because they're going to go out there and be um, you know, the future culinary leaders of the world. And I, st- I still feel that in the hospitality leaders, the school has really evolved into the premier uh, hospitality college in, in the world, actually. And it, I'd say less than 50% of our graduates actually become chefs and more go into food and beverage, uh, research and development, entrepreneurship, management, uh, front of the house, wine, beer. Uh, we have over 4,000 graduates. When we, did the, when we did the brewery, we did some research, and we have over 4,000 uh, graduates that are involved in the beer industry or beer pubs or s- somehow. So there's a, um, that's, there's a tremendous interest in it. And uh, we've really... We just introduced a master's degree program in hospitality and and restaurant management, and uh, it's become a real, very excellent college. In terms of, like, you know, wine, beer, food pairings, I feel like that most chefs are comfortable with doing wine dinners, wine pairings. I've noticed uh, from my experience that not too many chefs are really up to doing beer pairings. Um, or maybe the quality of some of the, the food being made in those situations isn't what you'd expect from a good restaurant. I've also seen it happening in, in cider pairings as well, where a lot, of, a lot of chefs I don't feel like have been exposed to that or are comfortable with it. What are you guys doing about you know, food and beverage pairing, especially well, with the brewery at CIA? Well, Hutch and I have been doing uh, a couple beer dinners a year, at, usually at an American Bounty restaurant, which is sort of our farm-to-table restaurant at, at the school. We have four restaurants at the school. But we actually do the ultimate beer pairing once a year, and we call it the beef steak, uh, and that's every February. And I used to do them here in the city at, at Beacon, the restaurant I had, and I was fortunate enough to convince the powers to be to, let, to, to bring it up to the school. And we, we put 300 people in a big Farkson Hall that used to be the chapel for the for the when it was uh, when the college was a, a, a Jesuit semer- seminary years bef- years ago so it's a great room for it and it was and the idea the beefsteak came about around the turn of the century the 1820s when it was sort of an underground type of thing where um, and it was only men and you ate beef and you drank beer usually in the basement of a butcher shop and maybe some oysters to start some with some oysters yeah. definitely <laughs> yeah, sing, and, sing and some I've songs added, I've right? added a few things and there's singing and there's uh, a lot of beer drinking and a lot of and it's all around roasting large chunks of beef and eating as much I, I explain it to people whoever eats the most beef and drinks the most beer wins I don't know what they win but they, they, they win something it's a, it's a moral victory yeah. yeah and we so we do it um 
every Saturday, every year. This will be our sixth one this year. What's the exact uh, date? Because this sounds really cool. February 2nd. Yeah. It's February always, 2. It's, it's always a Saturday before the Super Bowl. So Hudson Hyde Park, New York. That's Hyde the Hudson Park, Valley. Yep. I love the beefsteak. Just yeah. <laughs> It's funny. If a number of years ago, a friend of mine brought up the beefsteak. And for a couple of years, I hosted in New York. Something not quite what a beefsteak was. We called it modern beefsteak. Yeah. Just because we had beef. <laughs> But uh, apparently in the old days, so the, uh, you guys sent me an article, Joseph Mitchell, who was right, a Joseph New Yorker Mitchell. writer, 1939, he was kind of looking back at the old beef steaks, talking about they were a male-only affair. Yeah. They weren't even uh, silverware. No silverware. And they we, weren't salads we, either. And we followed that rule. We, 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 let you have, we, we, we let you have silverware if you want, but we try to embarrass you if you use it. But, uh, and, and, and we do enjoy women being at it. And and they have a great time as, as do well. Do you have seats? Uh, we do have seats, but they're communal tables. They're 20, 20 people that don't know each other. It's a little awkward at first, but, but after a few beers, a couple, and a yeah, couple, couple steins of beer, you get over it. it, it. it so, Waldy mentioned this. The school was actually uh, before the, the CIA bought it was a Jesuit seminary. So there's this beautiful old chapel which now has become Farquharson Hall. So we have this huge, basically beer hall. So yeah. big long tables. You know, you arrive at the beefsteak and you get your apron, which you're going to need, and you get your hat and there's big blocks of cheddar with a knife in them and, and all and these mug. all this beautiful food that you really shouldn't touch because there's going to be a whole lot more good food that you really want to have. Uh, but yeah, you get a big mug and every year I brew a beer for it. Um, you know, at this at this event, the, the food is really the star. So we want a beer that is, you know, tasty but stays out of the way a little bit. So we do a nice Kolsch, which we call Beefsteak Blonde in yeah. front of the event. Uh, light, and that's light the, quaffable. That's the only the only beer available at the, the thing, and it's, we have servers come around with pitchers, and just keep refilling your pitcher, your your mug, as long as you want. And wow, sounds well, like actually fun. we don't even ask. We, <laughs> yeah, I, I tell the you servers have to put it away if, if you don't want more beer. I, I yeah. tell the servers if it's half full, fill it. Just yeah. keep it full. Just keep it. full. But then there's got to be I don't know. Is there six courses of food, and then yeah, at uh, least then you yeah. you get to the the beef at the you know, the show comes in, the beef gets paraded in uh, and carved in front. Tell of me, you we're and, gonna go right, you and me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Carnivores ev- delight. Everyone should go. It's yeah. a it's a yeah. it's a blast. Jamie um, did and John. Do you guys any traditions out on Long Island like that? Of any types of like, you know, back in alien. club community uh, <laughs> beef steaks. John, you want to take that one? There you go. Uh, I'm not sure about clam the, bakes. Yeah, I'm not sure about the beef steaks, yeah. but uh, there's <clears throat> definitely some events. Clam similar. bakes sound clam more bakes. Uh, more like Long Island. Than, yeah. Uh, yeah, and let's quick catch you. You poured a beer before. We're taking a short break, but what was the first beer? It was it some type of brown ale? It is, yeah. So every class of students I work with uh, has a research project, and they have to present different styles of beer to the class, all about the history of the style and what the flavor profile should be and all that. And then they vote on which one to brew as a class project for their graduation. So this is this semester's um, – they also get to name it. So this semester's class project is brown ale, uh, which was the student name for the beer. Uh, a very traditional kind of – Typical ch- student chunk. name. Um, yeah. <laughs> we get dumb, some good ones. Dumb names are okay as long as they're funny, and this one was kind of funny, so uh, I let them go with it. But yeah, and this and will then be. You put them on tap in the in the. Yeah, this egg, is on tap. This will be on tap in uh, the egg, and uh, probably at American Bounty, our, our farm table restaurant, and then it'll be on at the graduation, which is of course what the students are looking forward to. So they uh, they graduate pretty soon. All all the restaurants serve our beers on yep. tap. Yeah, we have uh, all the restaurants have anywhere between two and eight taps depending on the restaurant so it's worth going up there but over the holidays you're closed christmas time we close yes the 19th through the third so like a traditional college we have summer break and we have christmas break and we have uh a spring break so anytime you're coming up we have four we have five restaurants and we'd love to have you but you should probably call just to make sure the schedule is is think of it as a college restaurant. So it's wow. We are off to a great start. Matt, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. The holidays are just around the corner, and at Beer Sessions Radio, we don't just care about what's in your glass. There's one smart kitchen appliance that can make the best Thanksgiving turkey you've ever tasted, for real. Jules Sauvide uses precise temperature control and trademarked visual doneness guides to make perfect food every time. Cook incredible dishes at home via the Jewel app on your phone or tablet. Or try voice control cooking with the Jewel Amazon Alexa skill. Hey Alexa, dial me up a brisket. There's zero guesswork, so steak, chicken, seafood, turkey, roasts, eggs, all come out exactly the way you like them. Just be sure to save room for pumpkin pie. Jewel, perfect food every time. To get yours, visit chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E and enter our code HRN to get $15 off for a limited time. That's chefsteps.com 
slash J-O-U-L-E and enter our code HRN. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey, guys, it's that time of year, heritageradionetwork.org. We're looking for new members and support for the winter. Um, but there's a great, great group of people here running this place. There's a studio in the back of Roberta's. There's an office. Um, it takes a lot of people to keep this whole network going with over 30 shows, some about cheese, some some chef shows, farm shows, and uh, other food issue shows. But we're Beer Sessions Radio, and... You guys can help us out. Go to heritageradionetwork.org and uh, be a supporter for the winter, okay? All right, we got a great show here. we got Waldo Maloof, my, one of my favorite chefs. Uh, he's, he's the head of all the food and beverage at Culinary Institute of America. And you wouldn't believe it, but they have a brewery that Brooklyn Brewery helped them start. And Hutch, our buddy who was at Crossroads Brewery, is the head brewer there, too. Yeah, yeah, I've been there for, we opened up uh, a little over three years ago. Yeah. I tease Hutch all the time, and he has the best brewery, brewmaster job in the in the state, if not the country. Well, I mean, you know, for those of you that have worked, at, you know, work in the industry or have worked in restaurants, um, mostly my friends are really upset with me that I have air conditioning, and uh, we have a cleaning and maintenance crew. So when something breaks, a professional comes and fixes it, and you know, all I have to do is put in a work order. That's usually what gets really people really upset. I'm actually curious, like, how many applications did you get for that job? <laughs> <laughs> we did actually get quite a few. I, I think we did. I'm the best of thousands. I think is what we're going to say. Gonna don't, 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 <laughs> don't tell him too much. <laughs> but yes, he did. What he about did you, Jamie? Come to the top. I mean, yeah. have you been up to the, the brewery at CIA? Have you been up in the Hudson Valley for the the beer scene up there at all? I I have not been to the CIA, although I look forward to to uh, to going, especially now that uh, that that Hutch is here and, and Waldy. They're they're spearheading the the, the entire uh, uh, project. I think it's great. And yes, I'm definitely going to make my way up there. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, Hudson Valley, we do work with some producers up there. We're mostly on Long Island and uh, a lot of our grain that we get from Let's upstate. give it a back. So yeah. St. James Brewery on Long Saint Island. St. James Brewery. Uh, and you're a New York farm brewer. We're a New York farm brewery. And what that means is that we get uh, part, well, the, the law states that we get some of our ingredients from uh, farmers uh, in New York State. We do 100% wherever we can. Uh, that's what uh, we're all about. It's about promoting local farmers and promoting local agriculture, especially on Long Island. That's that's really our focus. And then, and John, let's. So we met you several years ago. Tell us about your family farm, and uh, you had the Kickstarter to to get a hop harvester. That's right. I think that's how we first met, Jimmy. That was uh, 2013. Um, my family's had the farm since uh, my great grandparents immigrated here. Uh, originally, it was a potato farm, um, then slowly transitioned to vegetables. Um, and like I had mentioned earlier, now we're specializing mainly in small berries, uh, asparagus, and the hops is the newest thing, which uh, we planted in 2010, uh, one of the first farms uh, in the state to do that. Um, and shortly after planting them, I realized it was a heck of a job to pick them all. Um, years ago, a hundred years ago, when hops were really popular in New York state, they would, you know, recruit people from the city to come out, uh, hop picking as a holiday and a festive activity. Um, that doesn't work that well anymore. So I needed to raise money to get a specialized German hop harvesting machine and, um, decided to do a Kickstarter and, uh, went to a few events in beer week and, that's how we met, and uh, it's been going great ever since. You know, we're looking to expand the hop yard. Um, the brewers that work with our hops are happy with the product, so uh, it's been coming along really nicely. I mean, we've, that's been a big part of our show. We've seen the growth of, of New York malt facilities and, and hop, hop farmers. I mean, Jamie, are you finding there's enough uh, malt and, and hops coming out of New York for you now? Yes, yes, without a doubt. There's enough, uh, not just in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality. Uh, we, we, we can get all of the product that we need here in New York State, uh, and we don't have to look any farther than that. Absolutely. And with with working with great farmers like John, John Stanley, and, uh, and a couple of other uh, family farms that we have on Long Island, it, it, it's worked out very well for us. Yeah. But you're also, because you're way out on Long Island, it's hard to get to you, isn't it? Well, that's, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I mean, do you <laughs> well, have guys delivering, taking the ferry from Connecticut? Or do they, do they uh, well, come you, all the way down uh, through the city and drive out? I was I was strategically thinking when I placed my brewery right in the middle of Long Island that we'd have access to our farmers, which are predominantly on the east end, uh, as well as uh, most of our customers in our markets, which which tend to be more towards the west end of, of Long Island, New York City as well. 
So uh, yeah, it's 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 a perfect spot for us. Not too hard to get to the farmers. Not too hard to get to uh, our our major markets. It, it it's great. It's great to see you, man. Yeah, and it's I always know great to see you. When you yeah. first started brewing that at my pub, Jimmy's number forty three, we were one of your first accounts in the city. That's true. So it's That's great true. to see you guys. You're one of our first supporters, and we thank you for that, yeah. Jimmy. Now I have a question for you, Jamie. As a farm brewery, um, I believe the requirement is going from twenty percent New York growing ingredients to sixty uh, percent next year. Uh, do you, uh, do you think that's still going to supply is still going to be there with the? Uh, uh, <clears throat> that's correct, Tony. In uh, the coming up in 2019, the uh, minimum that we can use of New York State product as per law is 60 percent, and uh, I believe a few years, six years or so after that, it's going to go up to 90 percent. So this is just kind of the midpoint of uh, of the. Um, but you guys are hitting it. You're going to hit those numbers. Yes, we do, and 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 we uh, we do it basically. Uh, we try to by working backwards by by noticing or taking notice of, of what the farmers are growing around us and, and working backwards in terms of what we want to produce uh, and, and brew uh, or, and sell really comes from our farmers. So what, what, the, what they have and what's fresh is, is what we want. So. And for our listeners, <clears throat> next week's show, December 18th, we have Jason Saylor from Strong Rope with a couple uh, other New York farmers and hop growers. We'll be talking specifically about New York sourcing. So um, Hutch at, at CA Brewery, are you buying any ingredients from local farms? I know that yeah. like what CA has done is you guys have made a huge imprint. You go to the, that part of the Hudson Valley, there's so many great little restaurants run by CIA grads. Um, there must be a lot of farms that supply your campus, you know, but uh, you, you can talk about are. that yeah. in general, but also in terms of the beer. Yeah, we, we do. Um, you know, we're not a farm brewery, so we don't buy, you know, we're not looking for it. We don't necessarily have to get a number uh, percentage, but we, uh, we do support and use Hudson Valley malt. Up in Germantown, Dennis does some great floor malted, uh, traditional pale malts and, and pilsners and stuff up there. Um, a little bit of hops um, from the Finger Lakes, but I'm actually really curious to learn more about your hops yeah. uh, out Long Island because I'm always looking for, for interesting New York hops. You know, one of the challenges, um, and I think you guys could probably talk to this, uh, it's not that we don't have the, the amount of ingredients in New York or that we don't have the quality, but the varieties can be somewhat limited because especially these days with the current trends and IPAs and what people really are buying a lot of, uh, these big, particular tr- uh, tropical fruit flavors and hops, those are all proprietary brands that are uh, plants that we can't buy and grow here in New York. So what we really need is to promote and, and grow a New York variety hop that is unique to New York. Uh, but yeah, we do support uh, the local maltster as much as we can. Uh, and then when we're looking for non-traditional ingredients, yeah, we're absolutely going to be bringing in local stuff. Uh, we have a brew coming up uh, this week, actually a collaboration with Toast USA. Uh, which is a, a brewery that um, uses leftover bread as their they use we, bread we know them toast yeah, yeah from yeah. Bre- from bread alone yeah. uh, so we're actually harvesting we're getting left we're harvesting we're, we're saving leftover bread from apple pie bakery our cafe as well as from our high volume kitchen here uh, that's in the egg and we're brewing a beer that's about twenty five percent wasted bread basically uh, but we also use a lot of uh, local Hudson Valley purveyors when it comes to fruits or spur- spices or herbs or anything else that we can use and actually we have a lot of stuff growing on the campus. And so we've been working on using that in beer. We have, you know, on the roof of the egg where the brewery is, we have uh, strawberry plants. And I said, hey, look, anything that doesn't look good, I so can the, use it. The students are, are growing. Yeah, and they're harvesting it. Students are growing and harvesting, and, and that is growing and more and more. You start we're, next year, we, our farm-to-table program, which is a bachelor's degree concentration, is moving from California back to here. And we're actually going to be... Uh, resurrecting FDR's Victory Garden on Terrific. FDR's home is is right next to the school and his presidential museum and the Victory Garden there is um uh just it's been languishing for a while so now we're we're joining the the, the federal park system and we're going the, our class is going to uh work, resurrect that and we'll be using that 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 produce in the school the school has relationships with over 75 different farms in the Hudson Valley, and we spend anywhere from a million to a million three on local products every year. Do you have anything in uh, foraging in the curriculum yet? Because well, that seems to be <clears throat> something I hear about. More Johnny, more. too. Come on, everybody. This is a good one. It's, it's, it's become a big deal. And we have one chef in particular, the, the, uh, one of the chefs at the American Bounty Restaurant, is he's passionate about it, and He's been uh, b- doing things and bringing things in and taking his students out foraging. And we, we 
don't, we can't really c- cook a lot. We cook with it and for ourselves, but we don't can't really sell it because it's not. It's forged, so you have to be a little bit careful. Sure. So, but we do we do foraging, and we and we um, ex- wait on that note. Experiment. So, if I have a friend, he's a chef, and he goes upstate, and he gets um, some of those spring, what are those, those spring onions that they are ramps. 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 Yeah. Is that something you can actually sell in your restaurant or not? Technically, <laughs> no. We'll call it a gray area. I think. Yeah, it's a gray area. Yeah. It's a gray area. Um, technically, not. But like the she- the chef he's talking about, Chef K Work, who's one of our chefs in American Bounty, our farm table restaurant, um, is really passionate about foraging and using the things that are growing even on campus, um, which we you know we really do pay attention to what's growing there. So he actually brought me a bunch of um, a bunch of hemlock branches and hemlock to to kind of experiment with. It wasn't a product that I ended up taking to full scale, uh, but it was really cool. And, and by the way, hemlock. The evergreen is not hemlock, the poisonous plant. Um, which, uh, when he first said hemlock, I had to go punch him. I'm like, didn't Socrates kill himself with that? Um, <laughs> but no, it's a, it's a it's a great evergreen uh, quality. So I actually experimented with that in an IPA to see if we could, you know, use that because there's a bunch of it growing on campus. Uh, it wasn't something that ended up coming to uh, fruition this past year, but maybe next year it might be a possibility. And, and Johnny, when uh, Tony asked about foraging, you kind of lit up. And then you said ramps before anybody else. Yeah, I just had that in my mind because I think that's a discipline that's, um, you know, certainly becoming more and more popular. A lot of my friends out on the East End who are chefs, we work with a lot of chefs um, that are our customers on the farm. And uh, it's definitely, you know, hear little bits here and there about what they're doing. And it's interesting stuff. You know, it's growing outside. It's natural. I can understand the reservations of it, um, you know, with certain food safety regulations but um, I think it's a good thing, and it's exciting. The flavors are, are unique, and it's different when you're when you're foraging uh, uh, wild plants, and, and the, the flavors are just that much more different than anything you're used to. And it's really a lot of fun and to great to eat. Let's, let's take a step back. Um, we're, we're drinking a St. James Brewery beer. What was that, Jamie? We are, we, well, the first beer that we had, Jimmy, was a, called a Mertil. <clears throat> it's our blueberry ale, and it's done with blueberries that are uh, grown and harvested right in... Uh, so St. James Brewery Mertil? St. James Brewery Mertil is uh, the name of the beer, and it's a blueberry ale. Mertil is uh, uh, the French word French. for blueberry. Yeah. Um, pretty, pr- try and keep it pretty basic, but... Uh, and you're always doing what, a kind of a Belgian-inspired farmhouse? All of our beers come from our, our house yeast strain, which which is derived from a Belgian strain. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, however, Jimmy, it's a topic for another show. Uh, we've we've come across a uh, yeast strain from an English shipwreck that went down right here off the coast of Long Island, about 21 miles. It was a Cunard luxury liner, uh, and we were able to harvest the yeast and repropagate that, and we're going to start brewing from that. But that's oh no, I have to ask. So, how yeah, you that's that. I, yeah, that, how did you J- harvest? James is a diver. A I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, we do a lot of deep sea <laughs> scuba diving here on Long Island. And you just swabbed it right off of something inside the ship? Uh yeah, we 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 did. We well, we pulled the bottles out from the hull of the ship uh, about uh, 20 feet down of the of the. Uh, of the seafloor. So you harvested from bottles that were in the ship. That's that correct. Were, okay. The, the, we were lucky enough because the bottles happened to be upside down in uh, uh, packed in mud. So we were, we were lucky That's, enough. That's and wait, incredibly how, cool. how did you know about this? Did someone say, oh, there's some bottles of yes. beer. Let's call Jamie. Yes, not just bottles of beer, bottles of wine, bottles of, of you name it. It was the first class holding area for the, for the first class dining room. Uh, and uh, just like every other shipwreck, uh, there's certain areas of the ship that will open up. Every winter, a storm will come. It'll knock a whole plate over, and and a, and this is exactly what happened. Uh, let's let's go back in time because we're talking sure. beefsteak. So this Cunard liner, what beers were on that luxury liner? Well, that that's a good question, and that's where we're at right now, trying to figure out where this actually came from. Uh, you've got your Guinness, uh, you've got your Bass, uh, um, all sops, Tony. Allsops. Allsops. You got me there. But uh, what era exactly we're we talking about here? Uh, 1880s. 1880s. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So definitely. So also, so, let's, so so that's actually the beef steaks were going pretty strong then. <laughs> Women didn't have the right to vote then, so well, you know you had a little more lively uh, <laughs> that the, all no, male gathering. I'm sure they were more li- more lively, but they became a little bit more. Uh, Sophisticated, I, I guess, when women started coming, and probably became better. And, but uh, what, what is it? So let's say it's eighteen eighties. <laughs> what would what would have been some of the beers? Probably know the styles, like you know, we said Kolsch or a, a lighter lager that would have been available here. What beers would have been available for beef steaks in New York back then? That's a great question for a beer historian. Um, I would think that most of the ales made in the, this part of the world at that time were 
uh, of English base, probably low hopped. Um, I would think on the sweeter side. I mean, there's there's a ton of history from New York City up through Poughkeepsie and Albany in the ales that were made at that time. I mean, this was the brewing center of of the United States, it's particularly Poughkeepsie and Albany, where there's a lot of beer coming out of this part of the world. Amazing to see these old breweries that were putting out, you know, twenty five, thirty thousand barrels. Exactly right here in Bushwick, right, was a brewing capital. But uh, I can also reference Ballantyne in, in Newark that uh, became famous for their IPA. That was quite hefty. And we, we know Rheingold was a, a big New York brewery. But other, you know, what, what would they have served at the beefsteaks back then? Um, I know that in the Hudson Formal Valley, Valley, there was a, the, the Vassar College people know, but the precursor to Vassar College was Vassar Brewing. Did yeah. You, does so, anybody know that? Yeah, the brother of, uh, of Matthew Hudson Vassar. Brewing? So um, German styles, right, were really... Yeah, it, well, it was... The family came across and uh, and, and made a, made a success of themselves. Uh, it was the, the the grandsons were the Vassars, one of whom started Vassar Hospital, the other whom left his bequest to become Vassar College. But yeah, they were the brewers, uh, and uh, it's still a lot of the money came from from beer. They, they went into the college and went into the hospital. Uh, Jimmy, I'd like also to just take it back a step from when we were talking about the CIA and how you were growing stuff at the CIA and using it. And, and I just want to talk to what, what Hutch had said about how y- y- strawberries, for example, if you can't use them, we can. And, and how important that is just in terms of us being a farm brewery. It's not so much where you get your ingredients from. It's also what you do with them uh, and where they end up as well. You know, it's, it's a big part of it. And I think that's a great thing that the, the CIA can add to their uh, overall curriculum, not just for the, uh, the food itself, but in order how to, how to sustainably uh, uh, grow. And, and did, did you make a beer with the blueberries also? We did. We used the blueberries that were grown uh, at Kinzella Farms right here. Uh, and Let's pour that. Sure. So just say the name of that beer. So it's St. James Brewery, and what beer is it? So this beer here is called Martil, and it's our blueberry ale. The blueberries come from Kinzella Farms in Wading River, uh, and it's a, it's a, uh, a Belgian-style ale. And the, what's nice about this beer is when you use real fruit, the skins uh, impart a lot of uh, color and, and some flavor. So you get a nice pink hue from the blueberry skins themselves, almost in the same way as a red grape uh, so being on Long Island, you're really taking advantage of the, the local products, which in your case are, is often fruit. That's correct. And, and every year is different. And that's the best part of it is we can't really replicate year from year what uh, is going to be available. We could get late frost, you know, so uh, it's, it's really great to work with the farmers that way. That's cool, man. Wow. We're going to take another short break. We'll be back in a few minutes and finish up here on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey, guys, it's almost Christmas. We've got a really cool show. We're talking about Culinary Institute of America, breweries, farm breweries on Long Island, Hudson Valley. It's cool. But quick shout out one more time, heritageradionetwork.org. That's our network. That's behind us. There's over 30 shows, shows about uh, cheese and, and chefs and farms. And, of course, we're Beer Sessions Radio. But it's that time of year, end of year giving, fundraising, membership drive, Heritage Radio Network. Dot org. All right, check it out. So, guys, Jamie, you just poured us. Uh, so, you're on Long Island. You're working with, with a lot of local farms, including John Conzeller, who's our buddy. But yep. you made a beer with blueberries. We make a blue uh, beer with blueberries. We start the season with strawberries, but the the blueberry uh, beer this year was uh, a particularly nice one. We had a nice crop of blueberries this year. So, uh, that, that's really what we look forward to every year is doing what we call our harvest series. Starts with strawberries because they're the first, or, or right where we are, that's the first fruit that's usually harvested, and it ends with apples. But uh, in between, we also have our blueberry beer and, and a few other. What stuff. I like about these these beers, Jamie, and then Hutch is going to tell me some of the te- techniques behind it. 
these aren't fruit wines. I mean, this is a beer. This tastes like a beer to me. So how do you use fruit in a way that doesn't turn into a, a fruit wine? That's correct, and, and that's, that's a, good, uh, a good statement. I, we, we like to accentuate the fruit, but all at the same time, we, we make beer. That's what we do. Uh, uh, so everything is done on a beer base, and then the, the, the fruit is there to um, become the star of the show. But at heart, we are a brewery, and, and so everything is barley-based, uh, and, and we like to keep it that way. But uh, uh, the fruits are the star of the show. I mean, I think it's all about balance, right? You're looking to highlight the, the flavor of this particular ingredient, in this case, blueberry or, or strawberry or fruit. Um, but when you think about when you eat blueberries or you eat strawberries, they're not particularly sweet. You know, they, they can have a lot of tartness and bite to them. When you have a sugary, sweet blueberry product, you know, beer, it, it's not real blueberries. It's some sort of sugary extract. So really what you're doing when you're, when you're showing off a beer like this, you've got the balance of that, that nice you know, malted barley base. You've got the nice kind of mildly tart blueberries, that great pink color. Like um, it's, a, it's a nicely balanced product. It's not over the top. It doesn't Are you, are you taste making any, any beers at CIA with fruit? We do some. Um, we, have a, we brought a, 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 a vice beer that I did with Garrett Oliver. He came up and collaborated with me. So sort of a sour beer, but a very mild sour with, um, with lemon zest. Uh, we've done a bunch of different things. Uh, actually, in collab, we're talking about a beer that I shouldn't talk about yet that involves an American fruit that most people don't use. Um, we, we do some. We do some stuff. Fruit is, is one of those, poison hemlock. Uh, it's not poison. No. It's not a poison Foraged, fruit. Illegal. Um, it's actually we're talking about doing a beer with pawpaw. I'm not familiar with pawpaw. Uh, I can't believe you just told me. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> Uh, Papa is going to get really expensive. Uh, it is already really expensive, so that will not uh, that won't be the, the problem. But um, yeah, you know, it's all about uh, creating using an a, a interesting ingredient, showing it off in an interesting way, but in a way that is balanced, right? You still have to sell this to customers; they still have to enjoy yeah. the, drinking the beer. I mean, I think this speaks to the evolution of for the sophistication, really, of, of brewing craft brewing, is that uh, you have a beer like this where the f the fruit flavor is there, but it's the first wave of these fruit beers that we had in the. 1990s and 1990s, they were very sweet, like Hutch was just talking about. And now it's like the nuance, you know, the the, the fruit flavor is there, but it's it's beer. As you yeah, know, this is great. Cheers, Jamie. Good job. So, Waldy, going way back, I'm trying to, you know, I, you're one of my heroes, and I know you know Michael Colomeco who had a show on this mm -hmm. network for a while. Um, you, many years ago, I know you, you you made a collaboration beer. When were you at? When you were at a uh, with uh, Garrett uh, Oliver from Brooklyn Brewery uh, at the Hudson River Club. We yeah. did. We did some collaboration. What did, what did you put in it? You had some interesting spices. It, it was it was for a game dinner, and we we made it with black peppercorns and juniper berries, if I'm not mistaken. Although I couldn't get Garrett to 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 re, to remember that, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was because uh, f to go with the venison and the and the peppercorn sauce and the ginger sauce. I mean the the not ginger the um, uh, the Juniper berries. So was that more of a chef's idea of what the beer should taste like, or was that Garrett's yeah. idea of what he uh, wanted to pair with it? I think it was probably the two of us drinking a beer and talking about the game dinner, and it came out. It just came about. That's how the best collaborations That's, happen, right? Let's yeah. have a beer and come up with something fun. And um, and and it, and it was excellent. And uh, and we did a few others. I did a couple. We did, at the Hudson River Club. We did a couple beer beer dinners. We did at the Rainbow Room. We did a couple of beer dinners with uh, with Garrett and uh, and. And Brooklyn, and we would always try to do something like that when we were matching the foods with the beers. You know, and also going back, I mean, Garrett's book, The Brewmaster's Table, is still to me the, one of the classics of, of food and beer in America. Um, did you work with him in, in any capacity of that, or give him any recipes uh, I, for that? I, 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 I'm in it, <laughs> and we 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 worked a little bit on. Uh, 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 he talked about the Hudson River Club. He talked about us collaborating on some beers and doing, and he and I um, matching foods to beers and actually doing beer dinners instead of wine dinners. And uh, and and he did it with a few a few of my friends with um, with Charlie Palmer at at at, um, at the River Cafe with uh, at the Union Square. Um, he did it with a, a, a few of us, and it really yeah. really came about no, and it's, made it what it is today. It's huge. You guys really made a big difference going back. So way back then, you were a student at Culinary Institute of America. You know, In terms of like the training that you went through then, and now 30 years later, you're, you're running some of the programs. I mean, how has the school changed since you were a student? Well, it's huge. 
compared to when I went in. There was 100 students on one campus when, when, I, when I went. Uh, now we have 2,200 students at this campus and 250 in California and 150 in Texas and 100 in Singapore. So it's a... Uh, and all our programs, we do a lot of programs with uh, Harvard, with the Army, with Navy, uh, with uh, different organizations. Um, our Menus of Change program is, is working with the National Restaurant Association. So we are way, we are, we are a major part of the food and beverage industry in this country and have, I'd like to think, and I like to say that the Culinary Institute of America has actually was part of the food and beverage movement that happened from the 1970s until until now. And what, what I've been able to watch happen uh, and be part of uh, for the last 40 years. And how do you see, now that you have the brewery at CIA, how do you see the, the role of that growing or changing or influencing the industry? Well, they, what, it's bec- what the school is becoming is a university, a, full, a full-fledged university based on hospitality, science, f- the way that food affects the world, the way that the food industry affects the world. It's the largest industry in the, in the world uh, and employs the most people and, um, and, uh, and obviously keeps us all you know, I've, all I've never heard anyone say that, but I believe you. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> we it, believe it, Wally, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, uh, and, and the effects of what, what food and eating and eating out and the effect, effects of uh, water and, and um, climate change, and, and we're all part of that. And, and the school is taking is being a major part of that. And uh, as it becomes that university and involved in research and medicine and uh, food science, uh, and that's that's really where it's going. A lot of that's driven by our students as well. Yes. I mean, you've got, you know, this is what we were talking before about, you know, sustainability and, and reusing um, or su- Making sure that everything is being used properly, you know, a lot of that is being from our is coming from our students. You know, we've all lived through sort of the the second or third iteration of the craft beer boom, where people um, are more passionate about craft beer in a local capacity, and that's a bigger part of a of a whole movement of people wanting artisanal local products, right? But now we're seeing it from students coming up that are 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. This is not a new thing for them. This is the way that they've grown up, and they want to take this to the next level. You know, we've got students who are the ones who are leading and facilitating these sort of movements. We've got students, you know, when I say, you know, kind of as a throwaway line, oh, you know, we want to reuse the strawberries that aren't being sold from the roof. Well, that's coming from a student. You know, when I talk about I want to reuse the bread that is coming from our bake shops that, you know, can't be sold anymore, that is being facilitated and led by a student who's coming to me and saying, I want to do this. Like, how do we make this happen? Or why aren't we doing it? Right. And that's grow- And that's now growing into programs. So now it's not just one kid, it's, it's or one, one, one young adult. It's whole programs as we grow into a university of, you know, how does food fit into our world, right? It's not just about a restaurant. It's not just about a chef. It's about, you know, we all touch food and drink on a daily basis. So how, do we, how does the school grow this, and how do our students lead us into that, that part of the world? Wow. And just let me, let me ask John, because John's a, uh, how many generations fa- is your family farm on the island? Uh, fourth. I'm fourth the fourth. Fourth. Yeah. So these, these larger world issues, climate change, sustainability, oh. use of ingredients, how do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, it's all relative. You know, I think mo- <clears throat> there's not a farmer out there who will tell you that climate change is not happening. We see it every year. You know, we were just talking about all the rain we had this past year is an abnormally high amount. And those are things that we need to, you know, plan for and try to understand about how we can still do what we do in an ever-changing uh, climate, you know. So it's uh, definitely an issue that's out there and people more and more are talking about. Jamie, anything about that? Well, I, <clears throat> what I was most impressed with when I went to John's farm was how he worked in uh, 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 the insecticides or, or natural insecticides and, and herbicides that they were uh, using what they had available uh, in lieu of, of uh, uh, bad pesticides and, and how they could work that in. And to me, that was a really amazing part of, of the new uh, farm movement. And hold on, we just want to give a quick plug. So Justin Kennedy, our producer, is here in the studio. He also produces our rivals at Steal This Beer. <laughs> oh, we're not a rival. Crazy Augie Carton, Carton Brewery, and uh, <laughs> Mr. John Hall is one, another one of those great 
uh, American beer editors and writers. So what's going on? You guys are up in Boston this weekend for an IPA festival. Yeah, we're going to be in Boston on Friday, this Friday, uh, December 14th, for a live show. with uh, It's at Sam Adams Brewery, the tasting room there, uh, with Sam Calgione from Dogfish Head. And, uh, yeah, I just want to give a shout-out to that. And, uh, and what does Steal the Spirit do? You've got guests come on with, what, two beers and a blind glass? Yeah, so it's very different than this show. We have one guest per show. It's me and Augie and John, and we talk about... Uh, and Augie you know, talks a lot. Augie talks a lot. Uh, John talks a lot. The guest gets to talk a little bit. Um, I pour the beer. And uh, we, do a, we do a blind tasting. Yeah, Tony was on recently. Uh, he can tell you all about uh, what happens on that show. And Jimmy, Another time. Been on, of course, yeah. <laughs> But, what, uh, what is nice is they uh, it's at Barcade in uh, in Jersey City, and they do have an open tab at the bar, so I took advantage. <laughs> <laughs> We're now at uh, Treadwell Park in downtown uh, in Manhattan, uh, so we switched from Barcade. But you're going to be in Boston. We'll be in Boston. Boston. Yeah, tickets are available on our website, uh, stillthisbeer.com. Okay, so if you're listening live, you'll hear this. If you're listening on podcasts, you won't. might so. <laughs> miss it. Yeah. But thank you, Justin. Yeah. And it's great to see you. So guys, you too, this has Jimmy. been a really cool show. One more time, I just want Waldy and Hotch, just give us a quick wrap up. Anything else you want to say? The beef steaks the coming beef up. The beef steak coming. Go online, uh, go to CIA restaurants, restaurant group and uh, go online, buy tickets. Come on up. It's an hour and a half on February 2nd. February 2nd, Saturday, February 2nd, the day before Super Bowl, the night before Super Bowl. So six courses of, of beef? Six courses uh, of beef, beef lamb, oysters. Shrimp. So you got the oysters, oysters. in there, Tony. Get we the, got oysters. Get the lamb. The lamb is where it's at. And it ends right at the end. We put a bottle of Taconic bourbon on the table and a bunch of empty glasses and some ice cubes. And that's how the that's and how then, the evening don't, ends. Don't, don't give me over. napkins <laughs> and don't give me any forks. No right? napkins, no silverware. We've people come up all the time. I don't think people will know how close Hyde Park is to the city. It's a really easy ride up the Metro North. Um, come see us. Go to the restaurants. Come see the brewery. Uh, you can get tickets to the beef steak at AmericanBountyRestaurant.com. Uh, if you go to our, our, our or, uh, or the CIA Restaurant Group. Yeah, uh, com. if you go to our uh, the Instagram page for the brewery, CIA Brewery, I posted the link to, in our bio. To well, the, I'm so glad you guys came out. It was a great focus of the show. I know your PR team with Gita Thanks for having us. was trying really hard to schedule this, and we did it. And we also got in jo- uh, John and Jamie. You guys just Thank give you, another Jimmy. quick shout out. Always a pleasure to see you, Jimmy. It's St. James Brewery. St. James Long Brewery. Long Island. Yep, Long Island, New York. Thank you. John Gonzalez, Gonzalez Farms. Thanks for having us, And John, us, were, you, were you guys yeah. were the first farm in New York to grow hops um, recently? One of the first. One the, of the first, first on Long Island. Um, not quite sure about upstate, but pretty early on, yeah. Yeah, well, we're still Definitely. rooting for you guys. And Appreciate Tony that. From Ale Street yeah, uh, News. Ale Street News, 27 years. Keep following us online. And Fun you, fact about the uh, CIA, the, the Tap New York Festival actually originated the first two years at the CIA. It did. Wow, that's cool. Well, hey, everyone, thanks for putting the show together. Justin Kennedy, our producer, Matt Patterson, engineer, Dylan Hoyer, our intern. Thanks for joining us here on the Heritage Radio Network.org. I'm Jimmy Carboni. We'll see you next week on Beer Sessions Radio talking about sourcing New York ingredients. All right. Woo! <laughs> Next year, Heritage Radio Network is turning 10. For the last decade, we've been committed to bringing listeners around the world the very best in food radio for free. Our small staff and incredible network of hosts work hard so that listeners can tune in each week to hear the important conversations in food policy, stay on the cutting edge of cocktail culture, and hear the latest updates in food tech. But there is no HRN without the support of listeners like you. Become a member of Heritage Radio Network today and help HRN get a strong start to our second decade. Choose from exclusive member gifts and stay in the loop on discounts to upcoming events. There's no better time to show your support. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate and wish HRN a happy birthday. <laughs>